We're back now with the start of the Ginso tree. So we've just finished our cutscene skip outside the door, we dash open and throw the water vein in, while we watch Gumo steal the other water vein. Same water vein? Who knows what? Those funny uh, reverse cutscenes we get to see there. So right off the top again, so here we have a little bit of a tricky jump from this bottom right platform up to the top center platform on screen right now. And the way that this is done to make it easier is you do this first jump as a backflip, which is done by pressing down before you press your jump. And the effect of a backflip jump is that it gets forced to be the maximum height of a jump. It's the same to press jump for one frame into a backflip as it is to press jump for the full half second. And uh, that just makes it easier to get a double jump out of the top of your jump rather than having to hold jump for the full duration and then release and quickly repress to get a double jump before you fall too much. Just makes this jump to this platform a little bit easier. But it's not like this is some kind of super tight frame perfect trick or anything like that. It's fairly forgiving, so you can kind of take whatever method you want for it. You could even, if you're having trouble with it, go over to the platform to the right and. Uh, jump from there. So anyways, it looks like this. Uh, if you miss this jump and this platform gets swinging, then it is best to go over to that platform to the right and jump from there because you'll have a little bit more height and it'll be easier. Because if the, the platform swings away from you as you jump up to it, then uh, <laughs> you can be out of range. So carrying on. Uh, if your movement through this room was good, which it was in this video, the slime will be out of your way at the top of this. You'll be off to the right like this, so you can just ignore him and jump up this wall here. Uh, if you had maybe a fall, the slime may have moved around a little bit, and in that case you can jump from the hanging platform just below us directly to the wall that we're on now. This may be a little bit of a trickier jump, but it keeps the slime out of your hair, so it's just an option to keep in mind if you, uh, if you have some issues here. Also to note at this point, uh, it doesn't happen in this video, but if you die in these first few rooms of Ginso, then your camera may be messed up when you respawn. And the reason for that is if you did the cutscene skip outside of Ginso where Gumo steals the water vein, then the camera is still trying to pan down to that cutscene when you reload and it kind of gets half stuck between that cutscene and Ginso. And the way to fix it if that happens to you is if you're in the first room of Ginso still, you can exit through the door and then re-enter and that gives time for the cutscene to play out a little bit more and returns the camera to normal. And if you're further than that, for some reason saving the game will snap the camera back to Ori, so you can just keep that in mind if it happens to you. Carrying on, going into the second room. These gamers here, to borrow the term from Metroid uh, as a way to call them, they will spawn in a consistent cycle in your first pass. If you have died though, you'll notice that they're doing something maybe a little different. But if your movement's consistent, then you'll notice that they're in consistent places it's easy to deal with. Now this room here, if it goes smoothly, it'll look something like this. But it's not all that important that it does go smoothly. Because this flower in this next room has already been gone its cycle at the moment you enter that previous room. So you can still catch the same cycle as I catch here. Uh, without having great movement. So if you want to stop and like get the health flower in that previous room, if you want to add an extra double jump, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't affect your time here as long as you make the same cycle. So uh, one thing to note here, we're just going to do this puzzle with one of these blocks. After the second shot goes through, push this block over the edge and continue to hold grab and right as you push it off the edge, and this will make it fall into a consistent position. If you release grab or right early, it can sometimes bounce off of the platform that it's falling through to, and that will cost you a lot of time because you have to wait for the shot to die, you have to get the platform or the, the block back into position. It's just a huge mess. So you can just let it fall through and you can follow the block through the portal. You should have plenty of time for that. And now we're on to the mini boss. So this is a basically an exercise in shot pacing or mashing depending on your preferred method of attack. Pretty much the, the longest fighting sequence in the game is right here. Uh, had we played the game through the intended route, we would have Charge Flame here, which would make it a lot faster, but the sequence break to Grotto is worth far more than the uh, time save on this mini boss. So we just plink away at him. It takes 40 hits to kill him, so I'm just gonna shoot him. Now, one thing to note about this is uh, it may be difficult to see, 
might not show up too well on this recording, but there's a one frame tell that gives away the position of the mini boss before he spawns. So for one frame, his model will appear at the next position that he's going to show up at. Uh, and you can use that to adapt to sort of the RNG of this fight. Now, where I'm standing here is what I would consider the default position for fighting him, because this covers three of his possible spawns without you really having to do much. So you just have to watch to see if the tell appears in the bottom right or top right positions and move over accordingly. It can take a little while to get used to it, but it's just something to be aware of, that there is uh, something to look for to mitigate any kind of bad luck about the boss appearing on the right side, because you can just move over to match him. So carrying on, we'll just fight the boss. I actually don't recall here if uh, we get to read any of the tells or not. Nope. You see the top right there, so I've moved a bit off the center of the platform, and I could see the bottom left there as well, not that it would matter too much because it gets covered in the default position. So here you notice I turned the UI on and I intentionally took damage. This is to set up the next ghost door. You want to be at an odd number of health leaving this room. You either want to be at one or three. So. Three is a little bit better, so what I'm going to do is intentionally get hit by the spikes down to two, because I was at an even number, and then I'm going to save to get regrouped to heal me for one point, and this sets up my health nicely for the next ghost turn. So we'll just go through, grab these keystones, and move on to the next room. A nice little movement trick here is you push up against this flower that I'm just over right now, and then when you're up against it, just holding left and holding a full single jump will cause you to fall nicely through this portal like this. You'll get hit by those spikes and you'll break this platform below, which lets you get through this area a little bit quicker. And uh, of course, if you have one or two health here, you can't do that. You have to jump to avoid dying. But if you have three health, this is why... 3 health is better than 1 here, is because you can do this damage boost, which saves a bit of time. And then, just a ghost door, so I'm going to throw in all the keys as I'm falling here. I'm holding a save as well, so the save goes off, and then I'll just jump off the door and into those spikes on the roof. You can also use the spikes to the left if you have more health, because it's hard to take two hits consecutively on those upper spikes, but, you know, not a big deal either way. So now we're at the bash tree, and now's a good time to take a little bit of a step away from this video and talk about a few bash mechanics. For this, we're going to go to this area later in the game because it's more wide open and helps demonstrate what I'm talking about. So as you probably know, what bash does is it lets us grab a lantern, enemy, projectile, stuff like that, throw ourselves in one direction off of it, and throw the target in another. Now, when we do a horizontal bash, holding the direction of our bash, we get this burst of speed initially, and then we quickly decelerate. There's a technique that lets you preserve the speed of a bash, called bash gliding, and simply, you just don't hold the directional inputs after your bash is released. So here it is, the left bash without directional inputs, takes me quite a bit farther. Bash gliding moves you to speed of about 18 units per second, versus the 11.6 that you're getting holding your direction, so when you can, bash gliding is a bit quicker. Of course, dashing along the ground is still faster than that, so it's pretty much only useful for situations where you can't be dashing on the ground, you want to be doing a bash glide. Now note that the speed of a bash glide does depend on the angle of the bash. If I do a bash upwards, you can see I'm going quite slow, it would be better for me to actually hold a direction there and get up to 11 speed because I'm moving slower than that at a steep angle bash like that. Now there's an ability that we'll get later in the run. I have it on this file, we don't have it yet at the bash tree called air dash. And when you air dash out of a bash glide, your speed gets set to 20, regardless of what the initial speed of the bash was. So if I'm doing a horizontal bash and I air dash, I get up to 20 speed, which is just a little bit faster than a normal bash glide, but this is very useful for vertical bashes. So if I'm bashing rather up and then I air dash, suddenly I'm going quite quickly out of that and it can save a fair bit of time to do that technique. 
Now there's another mechanic that's not necessary to use, but can be quite useful and is at least good to know about, called double bashing. Uh, the configuration guide has information on how to set this up to be somewhat easier on keyboard and mouse. For controller, it's just a difficult trick to do. The way double bashing works is by bashing a target the frame after you release a bash on it. And what this does is it gives you a second bash arrow on the target, and Ori's trajectory will follow the second bash arrow, but the target will follow the first bash arrow. So what it looks like is this, if I can get one here. I get a second arrow. Now you can't really tell what it's doing on that lantern, but if I were to go down here and grab an enemy, now I can I can juggle him like this all day, but I can also follow him with double bashes. This is not the easiest technique to get used to right away, but it can be quite useful, so I at least want to mention it, but I'm not going to use it much or at all in this tutorial, so I just wanted to point that out, and let's get back to them. Alright, carrying on. I'm just going to use our newfound bash ability to soar through this area. I'm using a mix of dash glides and bashes here. Uh, kind of preference which ones you have to use here. Now here is a little bit of a trick to get through this puzzle faster. You bash this shot at an angle to send it towards the open area, and then you dash ahead of it and then bash it directly into the wall. Now, uh, if you miss this once, it's not worth doing at all, so if you're having a hard time with it, or you know you just don't want to spend time on this little optimization, just shoot the shot to the left. Uh, a f completely flat bash sending the shot left will break the wall, and you can just wait you know, a second or two for that, not a big deal. Now we're moving on into our next trick here. This is called key duplication, and it's quite an interesting little trick that lets us skip the long swimming section in Swamp. So first up, we're going to place a save down here, and then we're going to go up and collect a few keystones. Uh, this damage boost up at the top of the wall is faster, but it's not necessary. You can just wait and bash the guy's shot if you're having trouble with it. No big deal. And now here is the interesting thing. I've picked up three of the keys in this area. And I'm going to <clears throat> make copies of these three keys. The way this is done is by dying with some keys in a door while your save is outside of that door's scene, which basically means your save has to be some distance away from the door, which varies by door. The save position we used earlier is good enough for this one. So if I die with keys in the door, what will happen is I'll respawn and then the game will think I left I left from the doors area and it'll put the keys back into my inventory, but after I respawn, which is before I picked them up on that save, which lets me get the keys again and have more keys going out of here. So it's just a fancy way to die quickly and throw the keys in. But this is a little bit precise, perhaps. Uh, what you can do here, instead of falling directly into the spikes and throwing the keys in, since if you're too far to the left in these spikes, uh, you won't be able to do the trick. You can just land on the platform, put the keys in, and then edge off the platform just a little bit. You need to be just barely off the platform to still be in range of this key door and die to the spikes. If you hurry, go off too much, then the keys will fall out of the door and the trick will fail. So here, we know the trick worked because after I'm dead, you can still see the keys in the door. If you're dead and the keys come out, then it doesn't work. You could also turn your UI on at this point. I don't think I did here, but it would show still three keys in my inventory at this point. So you, I can rekindle now to save the fact that I have those three keys, and I will just head through this section normally, this time picking up all of the keys that are available here. So we'll grab this fourth one, and then we'll head on through. And once again, we might as well go store. So let's just save and tie, and now we're through, and with some extra keystones. So now let's fight this mini boss. You can just bash the shot into him five times. And now finally, we are getting to the point where the route diverges majorly from the old one. The uh, clean water route would have gone and done the Ginsu escape here, but we are skipping that. 
because it is faster to do so. And we'll teleport down to the Moon Grotto teleporter we've had earlier. So we'll talk about the details of the clean water skip in the next video. That'll wrap us up for Ginso, and I'll catch you guys next time.